Harbour, I do. And that is, of course, why we've invited Kwame Dawes on this evening of all nights to come perform for us. Um, Kwame Dawes is very special. He is, as you all know from reading the bio and the various bits of literature we put out, he is an Emmy Award winning writer and performer. I mean, an Emmy, imagine being able to, oh yes, I'm an Emmy, the Emmy Award winning. That's, that's enough, really, isn't it? But it doesn't really stop there. Um, I mean, he's, he's also won loads of other awards, too. I mean, they're, they're too numerous to list, but I should probably just mention that he, he won the Ford Prize for poetry, which is, which is a, a really big one, isn't it? Um, he's a professor of the University of Nebraska, uh, a professor, you know. Um, he's I mean, new, numerous collections of poetry, again, too numerous to list. I'm sure we'll read some work from some of them. Uh, one of his latest anthologies that he's, he's edited is Jubilation, an anthology celebrating um, 50 years of independence, of Jamaican independence. So he does everything. He's just incredible. I can't phrase it highly enough. You'll just have to see. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together. Uh, really good to be here. I've enjoyed the, the open mic and the readings and so on. Um, and it's, it's actually quite entertaining to just sit down in the corner and, and, and listen to poetry and well, performances and so on before one reads. Um, I'll be reading for just about half an hour. Um, and then at, when the half an hour is over, then I'll stop. Uh, I'm going to read some poems from a collection called Wheels. I'll start with those poems. Uh, and Wheels is divided into, into several sections, and those sections represent um, the, the, the overall wheels is based on the, 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 the book of Ezekiel, the idea of the wheels interlocked in each other. And so vamps on that Negro spiritual about Ezekiel got the wheel way down in the middle of the air, you know, and all of that. Um, and, but also it's, it's a commentary about the world we are in and the way in which the world is turning and becoming more and more complicated. So the first part of Wheels is called Wheels, and those poems are a commentary on the political environment that we're living in today, and I'll read a couple of poems from that. Uh, some of the poems reflect on South Carolina, where I lived for about 19 years before I moved to, to Nebraska just a, a year and a half ago. Um, and those poems recall the, the, the history of Jim Crow and, and, and slavery and so on. Um, there's another sequence that is with Ethiopia and Haile Selassie and his experience in relation to England and, and um, to, to, to exile and the struggles of that and the way that is echoed in our present moment. Uh, and then there's a last section that is with the, um, well, not the last section, the last section that is with Haiti and the earthquake and what happened after the earthquake. And finally, Hope, which is a point about return. And these seem disparate, but they are all sort of circling around the idea of a poet trying to engage the present moment with, a, with, a, with an eye to the, to the past. I was watching the um, presidential debates in the United States. Um, I was watching it last night. Um, or the way it was early this morning. I should have been sleeping. Um, and, <laughs> well, it may not be of any interest to you, but it's a profound interest to me. Um, but, but Romney seemed to be carrying his own very well, um, which means he was lying. Like, <laughs> um, and it, it occurred to me, I, I wrote to somebody and I said, you know, if Obama doesn't win the elections, what is going to happen in America is that you're going to have a lot of uh, black people who will be behaving really badly, but in a kind of passive-aggressive way. Um, so we will, you know, I'll be failing students who are really passing, and I will, you know, and I'll do it with a smile, I'll just, you know, just fail them. Um, and then, you know, I will, um, you know, go, you know, if I'm going to the store and so on, and somebody does something to me, I'll just suddenly, you know, just blurt out some expletive, and, and then they'll ask me what is wrong. I say, it's, it's, it's okay, it's nothing. Um, and, and then I eat popcorn every day. This is one of my, my, my fetishes. I eat a lot of popcorn. And, and I thought, the first thing I'll do when I go to the popcorn lady is to ask her, um, why, why is all your popcorn white? <laughs> 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 so, black popcorn. I 
and children, of course, look at me very positive. And I'll say, it's okay, it's okay, I'll just have to wipe off for this one. <laughs> and then I'll just walk off, just humming, we shall um, And just really confuse people. So that's going to be, it's like, if people don't realize that in the all over America, that kind of passive aggressive aggression. Um, so, <laughs> that is a proposal to this poem that I'm going to read, which is about George Bush. Um, which would mean that we'll have another Bush, which would be George Romney. Um, the poem is called Our Colossal Fleet. I'm a little partisan on this matter, as you know. Just, just a little. Just a little. Our Colossal Father again. Sub heavy world. Sub as you spin. WH Born. One. The portrait painters are works like faith that turns the wafer, the decanter of wine into something else. A dragon swaggers through the portal of our century, striding into a gothic sky. Two. In another country, olive groves and gleaming mosques are pulverized to dust. Outside the white courtyards, bloody streets fade after sudden explosions. Three, he is a throwback to grand lawgivers who stretch their arms over the world. He will remember, we will remember him for his Augustian self-denial, the last beer he drank, and his mealy-mouthed sermons. For his prophets pour oil that rises in flood across the marbled floor. Better a good name than costly oil, the day of death than the day of birth. In the faint light of dust, he seems to be walking on water. I can't, my eyesight, I have cornea transplant, so it's hard to see with no light. 
how to pick a hanging tree. Pastoral scene of the gallant south, the bulging eyes and the twisted mouth, scent of magnolias sweet and fresh, then the sudden smell of burning flesh. Louis Allen. Young trees may look sturdy, but they have no memory. They are green so near the surface they bend with the sudden light. And the truth is that not all trees can carry a man's dead weight. With enough air between pointed toes and earth, with enough height so that the scent of rotten can carry far enough to be a message for those who are sniffing the muggy air for news. Old as it may look, craggy, bark, twisted branches, drooping limbs, old as it may seem, sitting there by the edge of the canal, that live oak understands the simple rituals of hanging. See, there is the natural notch where the rope will slip and hold. And here, angled like this, the damp air off the river carries the decay for miles and miles. Sometimes, a fresh tree will simply die after the piss of a dying man seeps into its roots. Sometimes, a tree will start to rot from guilt or something like a curse. But the old trees, seasoned by the flame of summer lightning and hardened to tears, know it is nothing to be a tree, mute and heartless just strong enough to carry a man until he turns to air. Like I said, some of the pieces that I'll read, um, they, they, there's a section called The Measure. These are poems for, for Haile Selassie. Um, Selassie was in, was in exile in, in the UK during the Second World War. Um, and, and he was in exile because the Italians had invaded his, his country. Um, I visited um, Ethiopia a few years ago. I was doing this project for the BBC. And, um, and I met a man called Solomon Ephraim. Um, and Solomon Ephraim Wolf was a, was a Rasta man from Jamaica who had settled in Ethiopia in the late 1960s in land that Haile Selassie had, had set on 500 acres for, um, for anybody who was in exile from Africa and believed they were to settle there. It's called Sheshimani and it's still there. Um, this, this is a poem that came out of an encounter with Solomon. I, we had a great interview until I asked him a question that you don't ask a genuine Rasta man, which is, how does it feel since Selassie died? Um, and if you know that a genuine Rasta man would, 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 would find that offensive because, of course, um, Selassie did not die. And, um, and for them, that is, is a, is a tenet of the faith. So this is what happened in that situation. And I, I invoke, invoke um, Burning Spear um, a great deal at this point. African Postman for Solomon Ephraim Wolf. Solomon, who is that? Is the African Postman Daddy Burning Spear? East from Addis Ababa and then south, deep into the rift valley. I can hear the horns trumpeting over the flat-roofed acacia trees. See African women bend low, with wood heavy on their backs, and the cows, goats, donkeys, mules, sheep, and horses snap into obedient herds by sprinting children. We move along the roadside. Life happens here. I'm traveling to the land I have heard about, Shishimani, the green place, 500 acres of jazz benevolence, and I know now that I long to hear the rootsman tell me how, despite rumors of his passing, the Nati keeps on riding, keeps on standing in the fields of praise to hold on to the faith of roots people. Brother Solomon, you put the name Ephraim on your head, 
and carry the face of the true Rasta, the face of an Ashanti warrior, eyes deep on the heavy lids, and your skin tight as leather, blacker than black. I have met you before on the streets of Kingston, there where you trod to the hiss and slander of the heathen, you, Natty Dread, gathering the people's broken minds into your calabash. You carry it all and you tell them, return to the roots, the healing shall take place. You are Bernard Spear, his voice in the fields of Teth. You tell me of the prophecy of Marcus and I listen to you through the phlegm, through the gruff of your voice. Then suddenly when I ask about the passing of the emperor, you rise up like a staff of correction. Your voice reaching back to the mountains, your warrior self, your Yaman greatness, and you speak a mystery of those who have ears but won't hear, those who have eyes and won't see. And I know that this dread will one day stand in this soil and find his feet growing roots, that soon the earth will be darker for the arrival of sun. Let the heathen rage, let the doubters scoff, let this Ghanaian youth whose eyes have seen the face of Jesus Christ, let him too sit and marvel at the faith of the Nati, for this African postman has forgotten, forsaken father and mother and has come to stand before his imperial majesty to call only him father, so that the father might call him son, and the world will carry on its weary march. And the irises will swoop in the Ethiopian dusk, and the smoke will rise from wood fires, and the night will come with news that the rootsman, after 400 years of being told he is homeless, has come home, yes, Jack has come home. Sons and daughters of his imperial majesty, I will say that's the earth rightful ruler without any apology say. This is the time when I and I and I and I should come home. Yes, John. Oh, come on home before. Come on home before. Now they go. Now they go. around 
found her, convinced her that she, she needed companionship and a little fun in her life. Um, and it, it happened at the same time when she managed to convince a man who had been taking rat poisoning to kill himself, having heard that he was HIV positive. She convinced him not to do so. And in the process, um, they found each other. So this is the love story of Malia and um, this, 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 this gentleman. And, um, and I met them and I spent a lot of time with them. They're, it's a love story and someone must cherish the, the part of the story that is this rich, powerful love story. They fight a lot and all that wonderful stuff, but there's that moment that I try to capture here. And many of the things that are quoted in this piece, or it's, these are things that they've said to me. So it's called Gantier. And this is in his voice. I thought he said of the wife who lasted well in his voice, sort of. <clears throat> she just said, you'll get confused if I understand that. Gantier. I thought he said of the wife who lasted six months until the news of this treachery of the blood, before he lay on his back, the bottles of toxic drugs and poison for rats lined up on his sill, before the simple equation of fatigue with the world, plus a body falling to ruin, a heart shattered by a woman's laughter, before she had left that wife, the woman of beauty who knew her beauty. I thought, he said, she was an angel, but she wasn't, as sometimes happens. But now, he smiled that lazy trickster grin, his amber eyes sparkling, he's found his archangel. And this is how a cliché for a pop song becomes a hymn for saints. She came and saved him, the way archangels come into a room, not asking permission, walking in wingless as if they have an army of angels at their command, like the scent of incense filling your breath and anointing you, and you fall in line. This is bigger than love. A book, an apocryphal book with chapter and verse could be written about this thing, the voice of God commanding the mystery of celestial beings, sacrificed as the mates of flesh meat humans. She is this archangel with a wound in her body as if the whole thing was planned. I will place a curse on you. Something haunting like leprosy would have been had they not found its cure. Something reserved for the damned, they say. They that think you must whisper in the shadow of crannies where thin bodies uh, lie sprawled out or straining for air. I will let her carry this disease and then I will command you to marry her. Take her as your wife and you will learn how much bigger the desire this love is, how much wider than hunger. He looked at her lying there on the stomach of the mattress covered in a white sheet out there on the porch where the air is cooler, dressed in her pink church skirt suit, looking at him, having fed him, given him water to drink, poured water for his hands, and he said, I do not deserve her. Her name should be Grace. I do not deserve this shelter. And I ask her all the time, why do you love me? And she says, it is bigger than me and you. And that is all she says. Maybe a man must always wait to touch the flesh of an archangel. A man must come to the body of an archangel as to an altar. A man must not let the light in her eyes fool him into thinking this is ordinary flesh. A man must wait to marry her properly, give her a ring, give her the laughter of a family gathered. A man must do all these things before he falls prostrate before the body of an archangel who does not even know she is divine except in the way a vessel knows it is set aside for pure water. Love is desperate like this for those who have come away from the cataclysm of dust and stone, those who have come to know the ending of all things, those who live as if tomorrow is not promised. This is how love is for those cursed with the love of our kingdoms. <clears throat> Um, and 
I think she'd appreciate my reading down here. But if she doesn't, she won't know. <laughs> so I'll read these two poems. The marimba is going to go off just as I'm reading um, one of them. I'm just preparing. <laughs> I'll stop and then I'll stop it and then I'll start again. It'll be okay. Or maybe I should stop it now. Let me stop it now. So that, because it's such a touching moment. And you know, you don't do love poems and then interrupt because that's called coitus interruptus. <laughs> which, which, which is very annoying, as some of you may know. Well, I know. I know. Let me not speak for you. If you have babies, you know exactly what I'm talking Okay. This is called Upon Our 14th Anniversary. This is for Lorna. It's also for Jamaica, and indirectly, it's for my kids, who I would say it's for if they were here, but since they're not here, I would say it's for Lorna. <laughs> <clears throat> and they're not that young, they're quite old. So. We drive through the irregular curves and dips of Kingston suburbs, deep craters, cluttered gullies, cutting through. Adra's tiny car is a shelter of laughter and the making of nostalgia. We know people die on these streets all the time, but tonight we are able to forget. We spend 30 minutes making nonsense of the rituals of violence, and for a day we recall the paths of our love. The brick porch where I sang songs into the night. The hall spine I walked up to see you in the powder blue frock. Your smile the first hit of a chronic addiction I still tremble for all these years later. Sometimes home is a poem of lament, but tonight we see Kingston as a freshly painted world of chaos, a kind of giddy playground, so that after the steamed snapper and gummy bami, the coconut water and guava pineapple juice at the fish place of the decent end of Constant Spring Road, Adra's car is filled with our children, so loud with playground laughter and the sweetness of children teetering on the edge of rudeness, singing Julio Iglesias and Simon and Garfunkel. We marvel at Kekele's deep baritone, him just barely 11, holding on to each note's curve as he anchors Paul Simon's thin voice until we arrive safely, feeling groovy at West Road. We sit in the dark until the last guitar strum, and our voices have settled into the hum of joy. And I understand again why I love you, why I love us. There is sunlight crawling across the lawn, 
despite the drought, it's resiliently green. Except the narrow path of old sod we laid, traumatized by neglect into a crude buzz cut. And this too is a symbol of our loss. It is August in Colombia. Nothing can fight in this heat. Just stay still. Maybe a small wind will blow. Maybe a small wind.
piano lesson. Um, Troy, the husband, has an affair and, um, and he comes to Rose and finally confesses and he says, I was, I, was, I was afraid that I was letting life slip me by and I didn't want to lose the joy in life and, and this woman just made me laugh and so on. And he was so convincing in his justification. And Rose looks at him and says, so do you think that I didn't want to laugh sometimes? And did, do you think I never had a chance to get that too? And yet I fought that desire because of you, because I was faithful to you. So it's a great conversation. It's a wonderful way that the playwright makes Troy sound so convincing one moment and then sound like a complete asshole the next moment when, <laughs> when she answers him. And you feel slightly embarrassed for having thought, Troy, that was actually quite smart. And then, and then, and then you realize, no, that wasn't so smart, Troy. Um, I don't know why I thought that was smart. Um, so so this, is, this is a poem that takes Rose, tells us where Rose is coming from and where she's come from. And it's called Before You. One. Yes, we were a country. Lived in shotgun shacks where the road loses its way to dirt and live oaks and all along the way ancient cypress. But we played deep in the swamp where Collins built his still and made sweet peach moonshine. That is where we made stories to cherish in our hearts. A place to reach for something warm, something to make a woman remember the blood rush in the head. Singing and doing the shake and stump to the blues there in the bush where she was that pretty thing. Her eyes soft with needing, her mouth full of lies. Two, yes. We was country, but even a country girl knows the power of her coochie, how it could wake her without mercy late at night because of the sweet mystery of a dream, because of the scent of burning tobacco in the air, the taste of a man, country, but I learned the common of liquor, how all haste leaves the head, how big laughter can rise off the skin like mist at dawn, country, but I was a fine believer in the power of my waistline. The bone-shifting sweetness of nights of blue air. The jewel joy where you let go all cares. Three. Before you, man, I didn't join no church. Before you, man, Bessie Smith was my girl. Before you, man, used to wear my skirt hitched up high around my thigh. Used to twirl, show off my hairy legs so men could think of all that hair climbing up. Before you, I told God to just wink for a minute while I learned the soft sighs of women. Before you, man, there were no fences, no gates, just a wide road. Before you, I used to swear like a whore and dance, all wild and loose. So don't think I have forgotten, despite my new self, this good, holy Christian. For before you, man, I traveled. Lord, I traveled every town from Mississippi to Pennsylvania was a shelter and I found a place to revel in the freedom and glorious regalia of a queen girl wearing silk and satin and shoes so pretty they became a drug. Before you, man, people called me Passion or Fast Rose or Magdalene who ain't any better than any hard dancing girl. I made men weep for their mamas, made bad women soft so they wanted to call me friend for life, sweet sister, and be my mother hands. Before you, I could run now. But now, you've taught this fast girl to take it slow. Thank you.